he says, don't say, don't introduce him, just say Ravi Kannan, Kachar Hospital, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have the Padma Shri Dr. Ravi Kannan, the winner of this year's Max SA Award 2023, who's going to give us a keynote and address. For Selco, every Max SA Award, is, Award winner is very special because Harisha Founder was also a Max SA Award winner. And as I was telling Dr. Kanan earlier today, I know how difficult and how, you know, strenuously they filter out the people who are selected for the Max SA Award winner. So, if he has won the Max SA Award winner, I think we should listen to him. So, let me very briefly introduce you to Dr. Uh, Ravi Kannan, he is the director of the Kochar Cancer Hospital and Research Center, a non-profit hospital that provides free cancer treatment. He is the recipient of the Padma Shri, a recognition in recognition of his exceptional distinguished service in the field of medicine from the Government of India in January 2020 and the 2023 Raman Maxwell Award. For his profession's highest ideals in public service, his combination of skills, commitment and compassion in pushing the boundaries of people-centered pro poor health care and cancer care and for having built without expectation of reward a beacon of hope for the millions of Indians in the state of Assam, thus setting a shining example for all. Dr. Ravi Kannan's name is a name that evokes deep respect and we are extremely honored to have Dr. Kannan here as part of the this. Can I request you all to put your hands together and welcome him to Thank you. Uh, thank you to Selco Foundation for inviting my colleagues and me to participate in today's meeting. Believe me, we have learned a lot today from the story of how the MCP tripped and shut off the whole communication. All the stalls outside, so much of ideas to learn today. Healthcare. Earlier, earlier years, healthcare used to be a tunnel, used to be a silo. There are doctors, and then there are nurses and technicians, and that's it. Today, healthcare is no longer the healthcare workers' domain. Healthcare is truly, in its broadest sense, multidisciplinary. There are engineers, there are software people, there are uh, lawyers, there are economists, there are social workers, like so many specialties contribute to healthcare and sometimes I think all these people who contribute to making healthcare better are actually more important than the core healthcare provider because healthcare is about the science of medicine, about cutting people open or giving injections or, or all that, but it is also about delivery. If you have top quality physicians and have poor delivery, poor access, poor reach, the whole system is a failure. On the other hand, if you have good quality professionals, doctors, nurses, but have top quality delivery, the whole outcome, the impact will be far more than what it otherwise would be. And so I think I think many of you here who are not in, in direct in the healthcare industry are actually more important than people like me in today's world. So thank you for taking that interest in healthcare. I work for a cancer hospital in, in the south of Assam in a town called Sister. Many of you who are, who are from the region know about it and as somebody pointed out, the problems Across the country, there are always problems in healthcare delivery, especially for people who are at the bottom of the socio-economic pyramid. And so we also have our problems. We have problems of terrain, of geography. Somebody very beautifully classified it this morning. And so these problems are there. There is so much of rain, travel is a problem, awareness, economics. So many issues are there. But then, but then we have to, there's no point in Tom coming that we have problems. Because ultimately problems are then made to be solved. And these are all opportunities for all of us to learn from what happened in the past and do better today and use today's experiences to do better tomorrow. In the 1990s, I worked for a hospital called the Kachar Cancer Hospital and Research Center. 
The story of how the hospital came into being is, is truly inspiring. As I was telling Dr. Bhaskati today, the story of the boat clinics is so inspiring. The same thing applies to the, the story of the hospital. In the 1990s, the only cancer hospital in the Northeast was in uh, Guwahati here at the Bibarwa Cancer Center. And for many parts of the region, transport travel was a big problem. And cancer care takes a long time. It is not like uh, typhoid or tumor or uh, malaria where you give a pill and it is taken care of. Chemotherapy takes six months, radiation takes two months, surgery. By the time treatment is over, it is more than a year. And then for the fatigue and the side effects to settle, by the time the individual comes back to productive life, it is easily a year and a half gone. In, in cases of some childhood cancers, it is more than two years. And the outcomes are often uncertain, especially when people come with advanced disease. Often, people will not survive. And, and, and before they die, they go through a lot of problems, a lot of suffering, which can be mitigated if we have good quality care available. But all that is not possible long distance. Even if you have to travel three, four hours for accessing cancer care, that is a recipe for disaster because people will default. They will defer treatment and face the consequences of it. The lay people knew this. Cancer incidence in the region is high because, in my opinion, because of lifestyle, there may be other causes also. But we know for a fact that in the Northeast, consumption of tobacco, very high. Areca nut, very high. Alcohol, and there are certain dietary practices. So, a whole lot of lifestyle um, practices that result in the higher incidence of cancer in the Northeast when compared to many other parts of the country. But the good thing about the Northeast is we have a limited population. The entire Northeast put together is a population of about 5 crores. And even if the incidence is higher, in absolute numbers, we only see about 50, 60,000 new cancers every year as opposed to 14 lakh or 15 lakh new cancers in the whole of the country. We account for a very small percentage of cancers in the country. And this gives us an opportunity to actually intervene now with great impact because the numbers are small. The incidence may be high, but in absolute numbers, the numbers are not as many. And so it is an opportunity for all of us working in the region to, to intervene and create a very positive impact, which could also be learning for people in other parts of the country and the world. Anyway, to go back to the old story, people found it very difficult to travel from the Barak Valley to Guwahati for treatment or to Kolkata for treatment. And so lay citizens of the valley got together and formed a cancer society. Very few doctors, but teachers, lawyers, engineers, trade people, various people got together. And then they went around door to door begging for money. And in those days, the local MP was an influential minister in the central government. He got them land. They put up the hospital. And when that hospital was set up, their former director, Dr. Chinmoy Chaudhary, went around different cancer centers trying to see how a cancer center should be administered. We joined much later. The hospital was established in 96. And all of us, British, I, many of us joined post-2007, good 10 years after the, order, after the hospital started. In the early years, we worked on a very simplistic thought process that if we were to provide low-cost or no-cost cancer care, boarding and lodging, everybody will come for treatment. That was our premise. And that is actually how we started off with, with the process in the cancer hospital. Those days we were seeing about 1,800 new people, out of whom about 600 would be cancers, and we would be treating about 200 of them, just under a third of them. And then, because we said low cost treatment, we said boarding lodging, we just presumed that everything will be well. Three, four years later, in 2011, we got a grant from the Indo American Cancer Association to start a division of palliative care. And as part of that, we had to make a presentation in the IACA's meeting in Kolkata. So we looked at our data and we found that 
about 30% of our patients came back for oral morphine. This was in 2011. But we said that's okay because people on palliative care have advanced disease and they are all dying and so they cannot come back to the hospital again like it did not bother us. But at that meeting, my colleague Iqbal and I went there. We actually said that this is what is happening for people on palliative care, but people whom we are treating with intent to cure are all doing well. And when we said that, even then we realized this was unsubstantiated. We had not verified this. We just presumed we are offering <coughs> low cost, no cost care, we are offering boarding lodging, so everybody is doing well. It's just a presumption. When we came back, I requested my colleague, Amit used to be in the registry those days, I requested Amit to find out what's happening. He came back with some very startling figures. He said, of 100 people who walk into the OPD, nearly 60%, 58 of them do not come back for a second visit. They come for a one visit and they go back and they never come back again. Out of the 42 that start treatment, only 28 complete treatment. Absolutely horrifying figures. That means all that we were doing had no impact. We were not making any difference to anybody's lives. And then we started thinking, what is happening? Why is this? We were doing everything that was right. And then we thought, nobody, those days we did not know about quality improvement and a structured methodology to improve quality. We had no idea of all these things. Nobody teaches us these things in medical school. And so we assumed, we, we looked at our records and then we found that nearly 80% of our patients were daily wage earners. And it struck us that that is probably the reason why they are not completing treatment. That when they come, because cancer treatment takes forever and if they have to come back again and again for a, care, for a patient in their families, the family stops and so they drop out. So we had a knee-jerk reaction. We said we would provide employment for caregivers. And then my colleague Abhijit, he is our IT uh, professional, he wrote out a software where we said every patient who leaves the hospital will go out with a follow-up date. And so we opened today's date, we find so many people have to come and as we see them, their names disappear, left behind are the people who have not come back here. We get on the phone and find out what's happening. Now we were smarter. We, we, next year we actually proactively audited the impact of these interventions and we found that nearly 55% of half the patients completed treatment. Not great, but not as bad as 30%. And then, you know, over the years we put in place a number of measures. We started satellite centers, we started a home care program. Home care is something that I must tell you about. It's basically meant for people who have advanced disease and are not able to come back to the hospital for care. And so somebody from the hospital will visit their homes to see how we can support them in the end of their lives. And, and what happened was, till that point of time, we had plenty of arguments in the hospital because there was a lot of mistrust. Many of my colleagues would quarrel with me saying that anybody who comes and cries, you say free treatment, but then they have money and they're not willing to spend on health care. But when we started visiting the homes of somebody talked about going into the community this morning, when we visit the homes of the population, for first time they realize that nobody is taking poverty. It is real. They don't have the resources for care and so they and so quickly the whole of all but all the members in my team got into the same place. Today, if somebody walked into the hospital and say they don't have money, our response is not prove it. Our response is how can we help you? The home care program actually helped create philosophy in the organization that brought all of us onto the same page. And so we put in place, we were charging 100 rupees as consultation fee valid for a month, any number of patients, any number of visits, any number of doctors. But then we realized that if they have to come again and again for cancer care every month, 100 rupees for poor people, a year, 1,200 rupees is a lot of money. So we quickly did our math and said one time payment of 500 rupees for a lifetime, no further charge. Immediately compliance improves. So we put in place a lot of measures over the years and today, we treat about 70% of patients that come to the hospital. Again, they're not very happy with this because if Tatanabur Hospital were to say they treat even 60%, 50% of patients that come to Tatanabur Hospital, that is a very good figure because 
Most patients come to Sangha Memorial Hospital from different parts of the country, from Sri Lanka, from Bihar, from Qatar, from wherever. They go there for an opinion and for guidance on treatment and then they will go back to their hometowns for treatment. But for us, we are the last step. There is nobody from, they don't come to us for an opinion and go to some smaller place for treatment. If they don't have treatment with us, they just go home and die. For us, we have to, 10% of the population may probably be able to go elsewhere for treatment. And so for us, we have to aim to treat about 90% of the people who come into the hospital. And our current thought is that distance from the hospital is a major detrimental factor in accessing care. If they have to travel from Surai to Sutcha, it is about 3, 4 hours. It will cost them 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 rupees. And so it's a, it's a disincentive. So what we are now looking at is our initial thought was we have this hospital and now we will put up satellite centers around us. So we started one satellite center in Haila Kandi, one satellite center in Karimgat. Then we were talking somewhere, a temple first offered us land in Barigram. So we put up a hospital, a clinic in Barigram. Our thought is each of these clinics will be daycare of days. We'll have about six to eight beds, not more than six to eight staff. And they will provide all OB consultations, they will provide follow-up, they will provide palliative care, they will provide basic diagnostics, endoscopy, ultrasound, x-rays, lab tests, and we will provide chemotherapy in these cells. Idea is the two most time and travel intensive programs in cancer care are for chemotherapy and for palliative care. People have to keep traveling again and again and again. It's a it's a it's a no-brainer, they will default. And so we want to provide all of this as close to the homes of people as possible. We plan that each of these satellite centers will have one man, one health worker trained in one group, one man, one. See, the thing is, somebody spoke very dispersed operation in the region. There are areas like the Jinnam Valley where access is so difficult and there will be small hamlets which have 30, 40 families, probably a population of less than 500, 600 or 1,000. And to put a clinic for each of these things is not going to be cost effective. So we're thinking we will populate, we will put one room centers around the around these clinics, which will have one man, one trained health man, health worker who will be able to deliver health messages, who will promote health, who will be able to promote early detection, who will deliver all the palliative care for the region. And if we operate on somebody and send them home, he will be able to remove the sutures. He will be able to remove the drain, provide a lot of basic health care in that region. And that, that was our con concept. Now recently the government of Tripura came forward and offered us 15 acres of land to try and replicate this model. And so suddenly our thoughts changed that we now think we must, we must... Earlier our thought was no more hospitals because hospitals are very difficult. But then opportunities have to be you know, accepted and we have to change our thoughts as by the opportunities that come up. Every, every, somebody says there are problems, every problem is an opportunity and if we don't see the opportunities, we won't be able to make think about change in the community. The other very thing, the very important thing that we are very passionate about is we have to work with the government. Nobody has the reach or the resources that the government has and all of us are small institutions or private players, cannot become the government. In a democracy, it is all right to say, you know, government does not take care of people, does not provide health, does not, does not. Many things are okay. But in the democracy, we are the government. We elect the government and if we don't work alongside the government, we are failing on our responsibilities as individual citizens. And so, we try different models. Every time we work in the community, we partner with the government. So, our first project many years ago, initially we were doing random camps every weekend. My colleagues and I would be out in the community carrying out what we thought were screening camps. Only to realize after a few years that these screening camps were not achieving anything. We would have kids as young as three months and people as old as 85 years all coming with unreasonable complaints and we were not really making any difference. So we stopped all these camps for a few years. 2016, the government of India came out with its guidelines for screening cancer and some NCDs. And their concept was the ASHA, the AHA, will mobilize the community, bring them to a sub-center where an AM will screen them and then they will go to the district hospital. And so, while in principle that looked good, the mathematics we thought did not favor that approach. So we said, because 
ANM has a population of 5,000. Each subcenter has two ANMs. They have a population of 10,000 approximately. And if they have, and they have to conduct delivery, they have to conduct books, they have to carry out vaccination camp, they have to uh, attend sanitation. A whole lot of things are dumped on the ANMs. And so we said each ASHA has a population of approximately 1,000. And out of that, the screen eligible population will be a third, about 350 people. And so we said if we could train the ASHA to triage examine the population, we could uh, actually see what is happening. Because that is a more doable project. And we said if the ASHA were to examine one individual in a day, in a year they would have completed their core population. So in the beginning, we actually devised a triage questionnaire. We gave the Tata Trust, gave us money to give tablet uh, computers to all the ASHA in the community. We chose a health block in July. And we looked at nearly 50,000 people. Now if you look at screening programs in most countries, like in the developing countries, the compliance to a screening program is somewhere between 5% to 40%. Because people who are well, and who are working on a daily basis for their earnings cannot be bothered to go and get themselves examined for the illness that they think they do not have. They will not comply. So we said the ASHA will examine the community in their homes. So they, they are hailed from that community and they know when the population will be in their homes. And they will go there and do this. The compliance to this program was more than 95%. We examined about 47, 48,000 people. We picked up about 50 cancers, about, about 130 pre-cancers, and the program worked very well. We also looked for diabetes and hypertension, and we found that in that population of about 50,000, we had nearly 4,000 people with diabetes and or hypertension. For every cancer, we had 30 patients with diabetes or hypertension. We didn't look at stroke, we didn't look at heart disease, and so the other NCDs are much more than than cancers. And this is not surprising because tobacco, awake nut, alcohol, dietary practices, lack of exercise, and some infections and inflammations account for about 60-70% of cancers in this country. But what is even more important is, what are the cause of heart disease, tobacco, alcohol, diet, exercise, stroke, tobacco, alcohol, diet, peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, premature, maternal, so many non-communicable diseases have the same set of characters. If we prevent cancer, all we have to do is address these four or five characteristics and change them. When we prevent cancer, we are actually preventing a whole lot of other non-communicable diseases and we are promoting health in the community, which is a, such an important citizen's responsibility. Anyway, Dhulai over, we said, oh, this is a great idea. But what we thought was, this is very labor intensive. The ASHA has to go from house to house to house and it is time consuming. And so we were wondering what happens if the ASHA instead of examining the, the ASHA were taught to say what is normal and what is abnormal. And one of the people from the hospital, a trained nurse or a doctor, would examine all the people who had an abnormality. Out of the 50,000 people we saw, only 5,000 had something that needed to be seen by a more uh, trained person. And out of that, as I said, we had 50 cancers and some 150 pre-cancers. So we said, what happens if the ASHA goes into the community and creates intense awareness? We just create the blitzkrieg of awareness. So we actually tried this in another health block, again along with the ICMR and the, and the uh, local health uh, machinery. So in Haila Kandir, Kartri Chara, similar population, the ASHA reached out to about 60,000 people. She created a bridge peak of it. This time, we used the CBAC form. Last day, in July, we had devised our own, it's a duplication of questionnaires. So we used the government CBAC form. And after we finished it, we gave the CBAC form to the government so that they could use it also. So the same process actually helped two uh, uh, different processes. So anyway, out of this 50,000 people who were given awareness, only about 5,000 people self-referred themselves. I have this problem, I have a lump in the breast, I have a something in the mouth, I have a difficult. 5,000 people came forward self-referred themselves for evaluation. And out of these 5,000 people, we had 89, nearly 90 people who had a cancer that was eventually proven. And we had 800 people who had some pre-cancer. 
And so we realize that creating awareness may be an even better way of picking up cancers and pre-cancers early rather than physically examining everybody. Screening, in my opinion, in this country is not a practical, but promoting early detection is a very viable way of reducing mortality and improving survival. So, in, when we were doing this project in Kharlichara, one of the Asha came and told us, why don't you use the public health distribution, the fair price shop, to create more awareness. We thought, okay, very good. One of the programs, uh, the block program officer told us, why don't you involve the elected level, the panchayat raj system in this story. So then we went back to the drawing board and said, let us use all the police, the army party workers, the school program, everybody in the community to create a convergent message. Everybody talks, see, ultimately we start, we achieve the population control because we all know when we were kids, we had Hamdo Hamare Do. Everywhere, this was, everybody spoke of Hamdo Hamare Do. Everywhere it was there. We had those posters, we had those drawings, we had, and so if there's convergent message, if the health department talks of, health promotion, the school stock of health promotion, police stock, fair price shop, distribute pamphlets. So what happens if we have convergent messaging across different multi-sectoral convergent messaging? And so that is something we have embarked on in um, Lakhipur just, just a few months ago. And then we got support from G. G is a company that does many things, so they offered us support. And so we stole uh, the story from the uh, board clinics in Brahmaputra. We said if along the Brahmaputra we have board clinics, what happens in difficult to access regions? What happens if we create a mobile clinic? Unlike infectious disease, somebody has fever, cough, cold, they have to be seen then and there. If there's a snake bite, they have to be attended to then and there. But for non-communicable diseases, even if you see them once or twice anywhere, it is more than enough. And so we said what happens if we use the Arsha to create awareness but in a difficult to access region like Lima Hassau, we have a traveling clinic that will go from sub-center to sub-center to sub-center, doing what we did in other areas. And so we are now working with the, the elected members of the uh, Autonomous Council in Lima Hassau. We are now starting a multi uh, a traveling cancer clinic that will also look at other NCDs and see how we can impact better. See, all these are theories. We don't know in practice if it will work. But there are so many models that we can look at and for a country like India, one size fits all will never work. Different areas, we can choose different models, tweak it to their own needs. And so, as, a, as, a, as an individual institution, we can contribute to the knowledge that is existing in communities and then and then the other thing that we are also doing is that our home care team goes for palliative care. In villages, the whole village is gathered to see what is happening. Why has this health worker come to the uh, home of this individual? And so once the palliative care program is done, we've done pain relief medication, we've uh, drained ascites, whatever we have done, we gather all the onlookers and talk to them about what the ASHA does, promoting awareness, we create awareness amongst the onlookers. At a given point of time, we may have 5, 10, 15, sometimes 25, 30 people watching. Others also will come on and join. And through this, we call it a PEP program. Prevention, Early Detection, Palliative Care. And through the PEP program, we have uh, people who have uh, come forward for evaluation and we've picked up cancers through, for, for about 1000 people screen, we've picked up about 25, 30 cancers in the last 6 months. And so there are, there are different, and so each of these, remember I spoke to you about these one room shows around the hospital, around the clinic, we're calling all of them as pet centers, where the health worker will promote prevention, will promote early detection, and they will offer palliative care. And so there are, there are different things that we do. In reducing costs, we were speaking about O and M. This is what I heard this morning, operations and maintenance. So, so many terms for us to learn, many things that are bewildering for us. Anyway, so somebody was talking about what happens in maintenance, how do you get the money from? So we also have these problems. So we, we, for us, reducing cost of care is, is one of our pet, pet, passionate goals. For everything, the lower we, we, we the reduce, the reduce the cost to, more likely that it will find application and acceptance in the community. 
So we are all part of what is called the National Cancer Grid. The National Cancer Grid is a loose conglomeration of about today 320 centers across the country. These are organizations engaged in cancer care, in treatment, in research, in Hello? patient support, in creating awareness, in supporting. So some way they are linked to cancer care. And out of these, there are about 200 or 250 or 280 centers that are actually hospitals. And our thought is, see, I'll tell you a personal story. When we joined, when I joined in 2007, we had a, we just installed a CT scan, and I called the vendor who supplies contrast for the CT scan for a discussion. He did not come to meet me. He would not come. He was not bothered. No problem. We bought the contrast. Two years later, our volumes increased. We were now doing about 1,000 scans a year. And so, at that time, the vendor came to meet me because now he was interested in selling his contract. No problem. Now, we use that thing as part of the National Cancer Grid, we are now 300 to 280 centers purchasing medicines. So, if I start up a whole hospital as one center, they have a very large volume of cancer. So, they buy a very large volume of drugs. So, the cost at which they were getting the drugs was much less than the cost at which I was buying in filter. So as part of the National Cancer Grid, all of us got together and we said we will purchase, we will bargain for the whole and grid as one unit. So we said that we have 300 centers, 300 centers will buy X chemo abiomycin. So many abiomycins will be purchased. What was the cost of abiomycin? So many. So we, what we call bulk purchasing. We learned this from Brazil. Brazil had to put linear accelerators in, and so they were looking at buying 100 linear accelerators. So they negotiated with Varian, and Varian was brought to its knees simply because they were buying 100 machines. And so we just copied that idea, like the boat coming idea. We just stole that idea, and we said we'll bulk, and today, so there is a drug called Trastuzumab, just to give you an example. After the map, when the patent was not was in, in, in the patent was on, we were buying after the map for nine lakh rupees, and that was beyond the reach of most of my patients. They were not even talking to my patients about after the map. Then the patent disappeared, and one of the drug companies came out with a generic brand. It came down to some 5.5 lakhs, again out of reach of. And then the National Cancer Grid came, and we bargained for after the map. Today, the cost of each, the cost of entire course of Rastuzumab is just 1.18 lakhs. So that is the power of group negotiation. Similarly, I can give you story of several drugs. So now we are looking at what happens if we buy equipment in bulk. So we are trying to negotiate for CT scans, for MRI, for many things in bulk. But there, there is a problem. Somebody wants a five-ring PET CT, somebody wants a three-ring PET CT, somebody wants a so that if, unlike drugs, getting a common platform for negotiating on equipment is proving to be a problem, but we will, we will deal with it. The other thing that happens is operations and maintenance. How do we pay for CNCs and AMCs? So one of the things we do is when the, till the purchase is made, the buyer is the king. Once the purchase is done, the vendor becomes the king, automatically. And so the time we have to negotiate is before we place an order, before we give them the check. And so there we negotiate for warrant, extended warranties for three years. We negotiate for the cost of CMCs for the next step. Typically the life of a uh, equipment is about 10 years, give or take. And so we cover 10 years of cost at the time of purchase. Sometimes we will pay upfront the entire 10 years cost. Sometimes we will freeze the price of the CMC and say, this is what we will pay and then it cannot be changed. When we buy radiation equipment, sometimes the sources have to be replaced. And so we negotiate for the cost of the sources before we buy the equipment. And so we are assured of, we bought a brachytherapy unit in 2010. And we are buying sources today at the same rate at which we purchased in 2010. And so these are, these are, Wicked tricks that we learn as we as we face problems, but then I very strongly believe in the power of group. If all of us as a group work together, I think there is no reason why we cannot solve many of our country's problems. Now, human resources is a problem. 
for our area, I was talking to uh, Mr. Venkat that how do we find doctors for this uh, uh, public PhDs? And so there is a problem. So a lot of times we the resort to task shifting. We don't have a radiologist. Our technicians have been trained to carry out CT guided biopsies. And our technicians are very good at it. We can be compared doctor versus technician and complications are not more and adequacy of tissue is the same. Our whole palliative care team is mostly nurse driven and they do an amazing job. So task shifting and then with the then, then we became part of the National Cancer Grid. National Cancer Grid helps train resources for a day. There are several ways in which we collaborate. But again, the power of a group over the power of an individual is something, something we are very passionate about. Finally, see all these years, we were the only cancer center there. And so, whether we did good or bad, we were the only center and everybody would clap us on our backs, everything is good. And Somewhere we made mistakes, somewhere we did good, and we are where we are today. But this situation will change. Government will open cancer centers all over the place. Very important, very good. Then what happens? What is going to be the relevance of an institution that has been there for many years? There will be private players coming into the story. There will be, so we will then become one amongst many. So what is our thought for the future? So, this is a problem that we are looking at in the organization. There's a lot of talk going on, brainstorming as to how do we negotiate our way into the future. Will we still be relevant? Should we shut the hospital down and do other things? So, several things crop up in our minds. One is, our core competency is patient care. And whatever, we all of us sat down and wrote down our uh, core values. We said we should be science-based, we should have team spirit, we should be great. We wrote down five, six things that we said we should never compromise on. Many things, future generations can have different problems. The solutions that they will find is going to be different from what we are doing. We cannot write a prescription for 50 years from now. But then some core values like honesty, integrity, faith, all these cannot be negotiated. Whether human beings are born today or born 100 years later, core values as a human being cannot change. So we wrote down what we thought are our core values. And then we now think what will happen. So our Basic core competency is patient care. And we believe that that cannot change. The type of patients may change. They may become more affluent, they may become more poor, they may be more whatever. But we will still have sick people coming into the organization. And our people focused, people centered approach should not change. Whatever we do, quality of care must be as good for everybody. With that, what else are we going to do? So, one of the things we are saying is, we must be more focused in the community. We must be invested in the community because that will keep us relevant. There will always be problems in the community and those problems will need solving as far as health care goes. We are saying we must invest more into research. Yes, there is a lot of research happening. There can be basic sciences which is very expensive and takes many drug development, 20, 30 years you have to work and then a drug may or may not make it into the market. So like that, we have many, many uh, areas that we can work in the community. And then our current passion is building leadership. We need leaders to take on future challenges in healthcare. And so we need to, so nobody taught us leadership skills. We made mistakes, we learned some, we did not learn some, we made good leaders, we made bad leaders. But leadership can be taught. If leadership is taught, we can create a generation where everybody has the potential for leadership. And so leadership is needed for healthcare. Leadership is needed in individual organizations like ours. And then, more importantly, leadership is needed in the community around us. We have, India is a young country. We have a whole lot of kids passing out of school, young adolescents and young adults. And all of them, we need to create role models for them to aim, follow, and unite their own philosophies in life. And so, as an organization that is stepping, looking forward to the future, this is what I think we should be doing. Again, I want to emphasize that together, all of us can change the way the country looks for the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'd like to please come forward to the speech and uh, request.
Dr. Ravitaman to kindly accept a token of our appreciation. Last couple of announcements. The guests coming in tomorrow, uh, we request you to kindly carry your registration kit, uh, ID card, and etc. And those who are staying back, uh, the same cabs who had carried you in the morning will carry you back. Please contact the hotel POCs or Circo Foundation colleagues. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening.